Good morning, Long Beach friends. Uh, this is the recording for Sunday, the 20th of September, 2020. Uh, and uh, you probably all know who I am, but I'm Joe. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to take off my mask to do the rest of the recording, but I wear it in the beginning just to, you know, remind everyone that we're still doing um, social distancing and protecting one another caring for one another by doing the best we can to not pass the virus around. So we're doing that in other ways, uh, in addition to masks today. So I'm going to take it off. And the added bonus of taking my mask off is I can sip my coffee. So I may be doing that as I get a little bit dry during the announcements and sermon. Uh, I want to make uh, the same couple of announcements I've been making the past few weeks. First of all, register to vote. Vote. I'm going to put a URL up here where you can register to vote if you're a California resident. And then uh, the census is winding down, or maybe it's winding down. I guess there's some court stuff going on with that. Whatever. Uh, there's another URL we'll put up here where you can do the, the census registration if in your household you haven't done that yet. Uh, and they may want you to register with some kind of number or something, but it'll explain at the URL. And then my third thing, uh, public service announcement this morning, is it is flu season beginning, and flu shots are widely available now. Uh, I'll be getting mine on my way home from doing, making this recording, assuming the drive-through line at Kaiser and Signal Hill is not too long. And you all won't be crowding that line because you won't see this until after I'm already done. I planned it that way. Uh, and um, if you want to know how to get a flu shot, there's lots of places to get them. If you have Kaiser as your health insurance, uh, there is a drive-through uh, way to get it. And at most of their uh, locations, they're giving them at a nurse's station uh, starting this week, I believe. Uh, starting actually before you watch this. I also want to remind you of the uh, Long Beach Church's Gathering for Prayer. Uh, we'll put up a graphic about that. It's on the 26th, and there's five locations uh, that are listed on this graphic. And then uh, one of them is kind of catty corner across the street from our church building. And I, I, I think I'm going to try to organize a way for us to participate online, because I know a number of people are not feeling confident about gathering in a crowd, even in an open space, even with social distancing. It just, we'd like to pray. We'd like to be a part of the prayer, but maybe not in that form. So I'll work on that. And uh, uh, it would probably be through uh, either YouTube Live or Face FaceTime or something like that. But I'll let you know through our social media channels. Uh, our sanctuary course is starting Tuesday. It's really uh, kind of full now. Uh, if you really, 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 really want to do it and you haven't let me know and signed up for it, uh, talk to me and we'll see if something can be arranged. But it's, uh, it's probably got as many people as it makes sense to start with at this point. Um, in past weeks, we've been talking about uh, the message of reconciliation. The quote from John Perkins that I like to give is, if you are a Christian, then your mission is reconciliation. And that's not cheap reconciliation. There's been a lot of cheap reconciliation where people make symbolic gestures at reconciliation, but don't really make the hard changes that really bring reconciliation. And that's what the whole set of protests that are happening now is about that there really need to be some difficult matters tackled. And as Christians, that should be uh, something that we're all on, on board with. Reconciliation for us is first with God. Uh, that's what gives us a foundation for reconciliation with others, for reconciliation with the world that God has left us to watch over and with ourselves even. And that in some of the things that we may have done in the past or not, you may have had things brought to your attention in our prayer times in the past, and this is my reminder each week to not let those fall by the wayside. If God has brought something to your attention that he, he has said that you need to deal with, that you need to do, whatever it is, uh, this is just your reminder. Pay attention to him, uh, and uh, don't, don't let that opportunity pass. Um, 
I'm going to move on into um, the sermon time now. Uh, I, as you may have noticed, I don't read my sermon. I don't have a carefully prepared written speech for the sermon. I have notes and then I try to let the spirit move me as I go through those notes, which means I don't always know exactly what I'm gonna say. I, I always pray about it. I, I lay it out before God and ask him to guide me. And I'd appreciate it if you would be in prayer about that uh, each week, especially uh, to just ask God to guide me or whoever else may be bringing the sermon that week to say what he wants to say to us. It's not about us, it's about him. And that's our, our goal in the way we approach this. So I'm gonna move on into the sermon now. If you wanna contact me, there's my contact information. And uh, I'll move to the sermon. Our sermon this week is the third in our Good Shepherd series. Uh, I am using a lot of material, or a lot of things I learned from material uh, that Kenneth Bailey presents in his book, The Good Shepherd. And he also has a video series, and they're not exactly the same. Uh, I have both watched the video several times and, and, and read the book and read the book, and I use it in preparation. Now, his presentation is, <laughs> well, let's just say he knows a lot, and he says a lot, and I boil that down into something that seems to fit what God wants me to say in the sermon. The very first week in our first uh, Good Shepherd uh, sermon, we worked through Psalm 23 to introduce the Good Shepherd design pattern in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, early on in the history of the church for the first few centuries, before Christianity became associated with government power, uh, the Good Shepherd, the fish and the vine were the symbols that Christians used. They didn't use the cross. Uh, it was too awful uh, a, a sign. It was still in use in those days. And so that Psalm 23 pattern of the Good Shepherd is what Jesus picked up, and we'll be talking about that today. But it was also picked up by prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, and last week we talked about Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And I mentioned Zechariah, but I didn't really go into Zechariah's use of it in the Hebrew Bible. Now, the truth is, it's used hundreds of times in Scripture, and we're not going to go through even close to uh, uh, most of them. We're just going to pick up a few that, um, we, th that I think will help us grasp what God was doing in using the shepherd design pattern, the good shepherd design pattern to communicate about himself. And, and, and then Jesus picked that up. And this week, it'll be in Luke chapter 15. Now, the point of the Good Shepherd design pattern in Scripture, starting in Psalm 23, is the Good Shepherd is God himself, right? He is the one who, who, who guides us, who takes us to green pastures, still waters, and so on. There's, there's a, some other ideas that come out of the Good Shepherd design pattern. There's the bad shepherd idea, the one who loses the sheep and doesn't go after them. The one who would rather not be bothered by the sheep. <laughs> there's, there's the idea of the lost sheep. Uh, that's a part of that pattern. There's the idea of when the good shepherd retrieves the lost sheep, there's a celebration. Uh, and, and those are all aspects of this design pattern that get, that get put together in different ways as God communicates his truth for different times and different um, uh, occasions in, in the history of his people and the church. Last week, we saw Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesy that God himself will come as the good shepherd and gather the lost flock from where it has been scattered, where out among the nations, out among the Gentiles. Uh, and, and that bad shepherds and bad sheep are gonna face consequences. Uh, those are parts of their prophecy. I want to remind us of the, the, the root of this pattern just by reading quickly Psalm 23, and then I'll be getting into Luke 15. So let me read Psalm 23, NIV version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you're with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Now you can see in that psalm, the beginning of this pattern. Who is the good shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd. He's the one who brings us into good things. Uh, even though we walk through the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death as it's traditionally translated. Um, he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, people who know why we don't deserve to have, be at that table with God. <laughs> and, and then we dwell with him forever. So I'm gonna jump into Luke 15. Uh, this is a parable that Jesus told. There's a lot going on in this parable. Uh, I'm, I'm really not gonna get the depths uh, in the time we have available for a sermon, but I think we can get some really valuable enhanced understanding of what Jesus' message is. I, I confess, I have read the pieces of this parable separately many times and not realized how they went together. And there are times when I did realize they went together, but I just wasn't clued in enough to the whole Good Shepherd design pattern to see what Jesus was saying. And frankly, I still don't think I have gotten to the bottom, to all the depths of what Jesus is communicating in, in Luke 15 or what Luke is telling us Jesus is, is communicating. Now, it's really important to understand the context of this parable. It's all about that context. And if you don't understand the context in which these stories that are in the parable are being told, you're not gonna understand what Jesus is want, wanting to communicate. So the context is established in the first two verses. I'll read those. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, interestingly, the English translation there puts man in there. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The Greek is a little more contemptuous than that. In Greek, it's this welcomes sinners and eats with them. It doesn't say man. They don't wanna say a noun attributed to Jesus. It's, it's very contemptuous. All right, what's the, what's the, context, the, the historical context here? Well, in, in the Judaism of these days, there were different streams of, of approaches to being God's people. There were the Sadducees. These are more wealthy Jews. They're wealthy because they've accommodated themselves to the Greek culture and the Roman government that is ruling over Judah, Judah and, and Samaria. And the, and the areas where, that are traditionally Israel. And they are um, not believers in immortality. Um, they're, we would kind of set them with folks that we call liberal Christians today. Um, they were people who followed Judaism, but in a way that uh, didn't take seriously some of the more supernatural elements or the, the life after death elements and, and things like that. There were, and they were the ones who were powerful. They were the ones who were uh, in leadership in the temple and in the city of Jerusalem. Then there were the Essenes. The Essenes were like the really extreme uh, uh, people of God who felt like the, the society was so corrupt they could no longer be a part of it. And so they moved away and formed alternate communities so that they wouldn't have to have anything to do with this corrupt society that was going on in Jerusalem. So they're not that much a part of what's going on in, in the gospel stories because they're, they're off in the desert in their communities somewhere. Then there's the Pharisees. The Pharisees disagreed with the Essenes. They said, yes, our society is very corrupt. It's really messed up, but we wanna be here in it. We wanna follow God seriously. And as long as we don't associate ourselves with those corrupt people, then we'll be okay. That took the form of, of table fellowship, right? That, so, so the idea was, if you're gonna prove you really are serious about following God, 
then you don't eat with those other people. You don't let them into your home. You stay separate while you live in the same communities. That was the Pharisees. They, they had this, this idea of friends. Uh, there's an Aramaic word that uh, Kenneth Bailey explains called habarim. Uh, and you had habarim table fellowship with people who were like you in their strict observance of the Mosaic law and their, their understanding that the, the, the powerful society was corrupt. And you protected yourself from the, quote, people of the land. That is those people who had compromised with Greek culture, with other languages, with, uh, with not following the Mosaic law uh, strictly and so on, the sinners, people of the land, they called them. And then there's a fourth category, zealots. Zealots are people who um, were mostly committed to a nationalistic approach to uh, being Jews. That is, we shouldn't have these Romans ruling over us. We shouldn't have these Greeks telling us what to do. We shouldn't have this governor in Syria over us or anything like that. We shouldn't even have Herod over us because he's not really a Jew, right? And so they're kind of like the political, um, some of them actually terrorists and assassins who wanted to overthrow the, the rulers who were dominating uh, the area and establish a new Jewish government. Now, among the zealots, there's all kinds of different parties. They would fight among themselves, and that was part of what happened when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. The different parties among the Jews killed each other off even. It was an awful situation. Now, these categories are not strictly separate, right? You, you, you might fit in more than one of them as a, as a person of the time. And, and what we're what we're seeing in this, in the beginning of Luke chapter 15, right, the tax collectors and sinners, people of the land, were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Those are the people you're not supposed to associate with. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this welcomes sinners and eats with them, right? In their, in their opinion, Jesus should not be associating with these people. He should be demonstrating that he is serious about following the law, that he's serious about maintaining his ritual purity from the corruption in the land, and, 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 and they're complaining, they're muttering. Here's this teacher, and he's hanging out with these low-life people. That was, that's what's going on. Well, Jesus hears this, right? They're saying it in a way, they expect him to address this issue. And he totally ignores the whole ritual purity thing. And he tells one parable, three stories. That's Luke chapter 15, all right? So there's three stories, and we're not gonna be able to get into all of them in depth, but we're gonna get into the first one, uh, especially because it is about a shepherd. All right, let's read it. Starting in verse three through verse seven. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, that is the same way that there will, in that same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, he is answering them partially in this story. He finishes it in the rest of his parable because the three stories go together. It's one parable, three stories. I did not really think of it that way always. There's a lot going on here. The first story Jesus uses this good shepherd design pattern to establish how he's going to communicate his answer to them. And he uses it in a very strong and very provocative way. We don't get that because we're used to thinking of Jesus as, the, as God incarnate. We're used to, to all the things that we believe as Christians. Well, they're not. He uses the good shepherd pattern and he puts himself in the position of the good shepherd. The good shepherd role, well, who is that? Who does he think he is? 
That's the place God takes in the design pattern. He tells this story of the good shepherd, and then he follows it with a story of a lost coin and a, and a good woman who finds it. And then he follows that up with a parable that we're very familiar with mostly, the prodigal son or the lost son. But think of it this way, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. That'll help you knit them together as one parable. We're gonna have to consider those other stories in a bit, but we're gonna focus on the good shepherd, the lost sheep story to start with. Shepherds are low status people in the society of the time. The shepherd is uh, uh, responsible in Jesus' story, a low status person. He's responsible to go find the sheep. So even a low status shepherd knows he's supposed to go after the sheep. Now, Jesus is saying to them, imagine yourself if you had 100 sheep and you lost one of them. That is, imagine yourself in the position of the bad shepherd, <laughs> all right? Only a bad shepherd would lose them and not go after them. That's, that's, that's the implication, right? And then another part of his story, there's the 99, and he leaves them in the open country, out away. He leaves them. What? That always bothered me as a little boy when I heard this story. Well, what about the 99? Who's taking care of them? And people would explain, well, he probably has some shepherd friends that he calls over to take care of them. And in practice, that is what would happen, right? In practice, a shepherd would not leave the 99 abandoned out in the open, right? He would, he would have some other shepherds who were with him, watch them while he went after the sheep. He would take them to a corral, then he would go after the sheep. Well, something like that would happen. But that's not Jesus' point. Right? He's telling this story to answer this accusation. You're eating with tax collectors and sinners. You shouldn't be doing that. So the 99 are left in the open country. We'll get back to that. He goes, he finds the sheep. It's helpless. It's scared, right? As, as they know sheep would be in that situation. And he joyfully, Jesus says, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and where does he take it? He doesn't take it back to the 99. He takes it home. He takes it home. What about the 99? They're left out. What happens at home? He calls his friends, his habarim, right? The other people of God that the Pharisees would be willing to associate with is the implication, right? He calls them, and what do they do? They come and they join him in the party celebrating the finding of the lost sheep. That's an unusual word that he uses. Habarim is, is, is the, the Aramaic word, and he's a different word in Greek uh, based on phileo. But that's what the Pharisees would be thinking this is, a, this is a, a loaded word in their culture. It's the people you're willing to associate with and have table fellowship with. He calls them and they join him in the celebration. Jesus is making it very clear that he is claiming to be the one good shepherd, God himself come to gather his people. That's what he's communicating to them. He is making a strong claim to be God in a human body in the way he's telling this story. And he speaks like a prophet. He's using this story in a way that, that just severely criticizes their approach like Jeremiah did, like Ezekiel did. Jeremiah and Ezekiel talked about God's anger toward the bad shepherds. And so they're thinking, they're thinking, is he gonna direct anger at us? He puts the, the complaining Pharisees in the position of having lost the sheep, being bad shepherds. But then he tells more of the story. I'm gonna tip, tip the story 
right? And you'll see it as we look at the rest at the other stories, right? What does he mean? Does he mean to direct his anger at them? What he's saying to them is, you are not trapped by past sin. No one is trapped by their past sin. Bad shepherds are punished, but you can have better. You can have something better than that. It's simple. A good shepherd goes after the sheep, brings it home. I'm bringing the lost sheep home that you lost. You don't like them, but they're your flock and you should be happy. Join me in the celebration. That's what he's going to invite them to. You are welcome at my table too. And he's going to tell more stories, right, that complete that invitation, that, that message. Now, there's a part of this that, that I, I want to make sure we get, right, the 99. We are expecting, we keep thinking, well, what about those 99? Is he never goes after them in Jesus' story. They are never brought home. We keep thinking there's going to be a place where he goes after those 99. The good shepherd's going to go after the 99. He doesn't do it. He invites his friends to a party and they rejoice. There's a contrast. The 99 are left out in the open fields. The friends come to the party. And he leaves that question of the 99 until the third story of the lost son. In this story, Jesus is, is explaining repentance is this. It's accepting the good shepherd's effort and acceptance will be found. Accept the good shepherd coming after you and you'll be welcomed home. Salvation, the good shepherd carries the sheep home. Just let him carry you. The 99 remain outside. Now, how does Jesus address them? He says, there is more joy in heaven over one who is lost and found than over 99 who do not need to repent. Well, here's the key. They think they don't need to repent, so they're staying outside. But the truth is there's no, not one who hasn't sinned. There's no such thing as the 99 who don't need to repent. There's zero who don't need to repent. But those who refuse to repent, who refuse to accept the shepherd, they're left outside. That's the message here. Moving on to the next story. Briefly, verse eight, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I found the lost, my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, to the Pharisees, women have very low status. And he's casting them in the position of a woman. He's challenging them about that. They're lower even than a shepherd. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying this is how it is in that culture. Jesus is comparing the Pharisees to a woman and saying, you lost a coin. And he's speaking to his women disciples all at the same time because he's including women in his story. Think how you feel if you lose your purse or you lose your wallet. That would be the equivalent thing in our day, right? This coin this coin is the equivalent of a day's wage, all right? So think about how much money it, you make in a day, and that's what's misplaced. That was what it was in the wallet that you lost, okay, or the purse that you lost, and you can't find it. And you look all over the place, and you have that panicked, sinking feeling. I've had that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> my wallet slipped out of my back pocket when I was at a coffee shop once. I got home and didn't have it. And I had this sinking feeling, you know, this in the pit of your stomach. And, and I, 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 I went back to the coffee shop and someone had found it and turned it in. And the money was even still in it. It was an amazing thing. I was happy. And you know what? I've told a lot of people that story. 
Well, that's what happens with the woman, right? And, and what's the implication here? Well, a coin is worth less than a sheep, and she's happy. A sheep is worth less than a human, and the shepherd's happy, and his friends are happy. And a human is less than a son, and how does God think about us? Right? What would, what would God's joy be like if he found a lost child? And he moves on to the third, right? The third story. All these fit together. It's really one comment. We know it as the story of the prodigal son. Think of it as the lost son. I don't have time to go through the whole story, right? But you know what happened. The younger son demands his inheritance unjustly. The father gives it to him. And he takes off, blows it all. He's, he's living in horrible circumstances and he thinks, you know, I'm just going to go home and beg to, to be a servant to my father. And he doesn't even make it home. He doesn't even make it home. His father runs to him, brings him home, and throws a party. And then what happens? The older son who never left He's not happy. He won't come to the party. He won't come to the, to the table. The father finds him sulking, thinking about his own righteousness in contrast to the younger son who's, who's being celebrated because he was found and brought home. Let me start reading in verse 28, chapter 15. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave, gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's Jesus' answer to their criticism. What is he communicating to them? Well, there's a lot, but I'll get the basic outline. These ones you're criticizing me for celebrating with, they're the lost sheep found by the good shepherd, and that's me. You should be celebrating too. Your bad shepherd do lost them. But just like them, I will accept you at the celebration if you let me find you too. You can either be the 99 lost in the open field, but I'm treating you like the older son. I'm inviting you. Are you going to come? And he, and he leaves it. He leaves it open. He doesn't tell us if the older son went in because it's their choice those Pharisees and teachers of the law who are criticizing him, are they going to accept to be found? That's still an open question. Most of them, we know, historically did not, or many of them at least. This parable of three stories has depths that I have not discussed today, and frankly, that I barely see myself, right? Because, because I'm not of this culture. There's a lot that I don't, that I don't understand yet. And Jesus' response is very sophisticated and deep. It has a lot uh, of deep water <laughs> in that river, all right? Uh, but this is the, the way he employs the design patterns that are established in the Bible. And in scripture, a lot of scripture is what we would call, the, the Bible project calls Jewish meditation literature. It's not intended that you get it all in one reading. It's intended that you read it and you think about it and you go away and you come back and you read it again and you think about it some more and, and God starts opening up to you deeper streams of thought, deeper meanings and ways that it applies to you by his spirit who guides you as you study it. And, th and that's what, I, what this pattern or what this parable in Luke chapter 15 with three stories is. Right? That's, that's what's going on here. So stepping back from Luke 15, to just look at the bigger picture 
of what we're picking up through this design pattern and how it's carried forward into, the, into Jesus's ministry, which we'll look at more at in, in weeks ahead. The good shepherd is God, right? The good shepherd goes looking for his lost sheep. That's the incarnation. God come among us, going into an unsafe place to look for his lost sheep. It's the incarnation. The lost sheep that are ready to be found are often the skinny sheep. The ones the fat sheep have shoved aside in the push for the food. They're uncared for by the, the bad shepherds that both Ezekiel and Jeremiah talk about. Repentance is, I will let you find me to the good shepherd. That's what we do. I will let you find me to the good shepherd. The good shepherd takes the sheep, puts it on his shoulders joyfully, joyfully when it's found and carries it to safely, safely, carries it to safety. That's the atonement. That's Jesus paying the price for whatever ugly situation in life we've gotten ourselves into, whatever it is. Now that's not the end of the story, right? That's not the end of our story of life with Jesus. There's more after, the, after being restored into, in, in, and reconciled with God, then there's the beginning of other kinds of reconciliation and carrying the image of God well and, and so on and so on that we've been created for. But that's the basic good news, the way we're saved out of, out of the, the mess that we've gotten into. Now, think about this story in our day, right? I, I, I'm really um, shocked sometimes at how there are people who say they follow Jesus and they seem serious about it, who are talking about other people like with contempt, pushing them away. In the church, we have a bad problem with this. We have a bad problem with liking to be around our own friends and other people feeling like outsiders. We don't intend it always. Sometimes we're contemptuous towards outsiders and that's just awful sin. Sometimes we're just not paying attention or we're paying too much attention to the people we already know and love and we don't have time for the lost sheep bothers me to say that. It's like our last pastor, David Nelson, used to say, when you, when you point your finger, there's three fingers pointing back at me. <laughs> Whenever I point my finger, there's three fingers pointing back at me. Uh, but that's the message Jesus is conveying in his answer to these Pharisees that are criticizing him for letting the people of the land come and eat with him. What do we do that's like that? Where do we push people away? Say they're not wanted. Where do we not listen to them? Because we disagree with them. How does that work in our, our lives or, or not work in our lives? So my challenge for us is to think through how do we become good shepherds? How do we become sheep who are not the fat sheep who push the skinny sheep aside? Because we want to hang on to our own, right? How, how do we manage that and follow Jesus? Jesus did not compromise on what the good news was, who God was, or what it was like to follow him. He didn't compromise on those things. But he welcomed those who wanted to be found. And he worked with them towards becoming the people God created them to be. Even Peter, more than three years after spending almost every day with Jesus, denied him. And what did Jesus do? He went after him. And he restored him. And what did he say to him? 
in that dramatic closing of John, feed my sheep, right? It's just stunning how this pattern works itself through the Bible, the whole Bible, even into Revelation. Well, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, first of all, we pray that we would not think of ourselves as those who do not need to repent. We are the righteous ones. That we would get that out of our heads. That we would not be the 99 left out in the open field because we're unwilling to be found. We would let you find us. We would let you carry us. Not our own righteousness, but you carry us home. And then, Lord, when we're home with you, we pray that we would be good, not just guests, not even just friends, but children adopted into your house. Children with the full inheritance rights of sons, as Scripture says. Not male, but using the cultural pattern, inheritors of all the good things that come from you, male and female. Lord, we pray that we would be people who carry your image well, that people could look at us and know what you are like, the good shepherd. In some sense, we're all called to be like you as a good shepherd. Guide us in what that looks like in our lives here today, in the middle of protests, in the middle of racism, in the middle of horribly partisan politics and, and considering other people with utter contempt. What does that look like for us today? In the middle of COVID-19, concern over health, how do we care for one another? All these things, Lord, uh, I don't have the answers to all these things, but you do. And if we follow you, we will walk on the right path. And we will be home with you, joyful in that celebration. We pray for this, and we pray for this for many people. The lost sheep who need to be found. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.